like to do is revisit a series of topics over the next several weeks that I've looked at before. It's been a couple of years, so it's been a while. And as I mentioned many times when I have an opportunity to speak, I like to speak from some of the experiences from my youth and young adulthood from the days of being in denominational churches. Issues with which I struggled, teachings that I have done incorrectly, that after being in the right division environment, I've learned. So many of you may not have had these experiences, so God bless you for not having them. But if you, like me, have come from a background which has not been right division, you may have struggled with this. And one of the things that is a forefront in many churches is this concept called the Great Commission. And so that's where I'd like to start today. And as I mentioned before, I tend to move pretty fast. We have a lot to cover today. So I wanted to provide you literally all the verses that I will be going through. I tend to read them verbatim, and I try to limit my comments uh, to just how it pertains to the scriptures and the teaching. So bear with me as I read through this. So most likely everyone has heard of the Great Commission. If you've been in any church setting from youth on up, you've heard about the Great Commission. And if you've been in a Bible-believing church, an evangelical church, you've probably been in mission conferences where we talk about the Great Commission constantly. And it's, again, most commonly spoken during mission conferences. But in reality, there are several commissions that have been recorded in the Bible, more than just the Great Commission. So over the next few lessons, I'd like to take a look at up to six of them. And today, I just want to take one of the first ones and how they fit according to right division. So this is mostly a teaching session today. Again, from my perspective, a teaching for me to help straighten out some of the things that I learned incorrectly through the years. So the first of these commissions is recorded in Matthew 10 and also in Luke 10. And I want to start with Roman numeral one, the context of this Matthew 10 commission. So if you want to follow along, this is the context of the Matthew 10 commission. It was first, first preached by John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, Matthew records, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the recurring theme that you hear about the Great Commission, is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So when Matthew was writing this down through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he is actually quoting Isaiah chapter 40. And you don't need to turn there with me. But when Matthew is recording this, and he says, for this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 40 verse 3, the rendering is, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So that is what John the Baptist's mission was, and as Matthew recorded it, that is where it came from in Isaiah. The Lord Jesus Christ declares this commission. In Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 12, we see what the Lord has to say. In verse 12 he says, Matthew writes, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast in prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zabulon and Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. So once again, we have Isaiah quoted here. Verse 15, The land of Zabulon, the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in the darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region, the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, that's the repeating theme. So again, the reason why I'm going back into the Old Testament is to help bring clarity to the, the context of the Great Commission. So again, Matthew, once again, is quoting Isaiah chapter 9 in this case. You don't have to turn there with me, but in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it reads, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lighted 
afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict, afflict, afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. As, as you can read, this is very similar to what was recorded in Matthew. Verse 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. So what I wanted to bring your attention in these first two verses, first of all, John the Baptist is the forerunner. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Jesus, when he started his mystery, he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this has been recorded in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. So keep that in the back of your mind. One of the characteristics I want to note for you is the preaching of the kingdom at hand. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. And because of the kingdom's prophecy in Isaiah and its revealing in Matthew, the message is clearly not for the dispensation of grace. And that's the clarity that I received as a growing member in the body of Christ that I did not clearly understand when I attended non-dispensational churches. Now, again, we may find some type of and I use this word loosely, some type of inspiration in, in this, and I don't necessarily mean it inspired in the sense that we need to follow it, but you may be intrigued by it. It may fire you up personally to go out and witness to people. But what you do is you need to be careful about applying the principles that we're going to see in this Great Commission because this is clearly Old Testament in nature. It is not for the dispensation of grace. So now looking at Roman numeral 2, what is this Matthew 10 commission? Let's look at it, and more importantly, let's look at some of the properties and characteristics of it, because I think this is going to help bring some clarity to what it is and why we can't necessarily follow everything in it. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 23, and for your benefit, I won't drone by reading all 23 verses, but I will read several of them. So please bear with me, and if you'd like to follow along, that's great. So Matthew chapter 10, verses 1. And when he had called unto, the 12, unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. That's certainly one characteristic. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. I won't go through those. He named all the 12 apostles, all the 12 apostles, and then verse 5, if you want to skip down to there, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, this is what you really need to get clear about this commission. In verse 5, he said, go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, as we have preached many times over the years, this is a verse that you hear quite frequently in most grace churches. But in this context, it certainly makes sense. The commission that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to these 12 apostles, he said, go not into the way of the Gentiles. So if we appropriate that, now in the dispensation of grace, we are not using this scripture rightly divided. Verse 7, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is not what we preach. We don't preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is not what we preach. Verse 8, heal the sick, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Again, we don't do that. You see that attempted in many churches. And all you have to do is turn on TV today. In Columbus, a lot of this is broadcast. Healing the sick. Cleansing the lepers, you don't see much. Raising the dead, I've not seen that yet. Um, but during the, the Great Tribulation, you know, you're going to see that. Again, verse 9, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. And in all of the mission conferences in which I have attended, I've never heard that. It's usually not that. So even when those that adopt this Great Commission, they don't necessarily follow all the characteristics of it. Starting again in verse 11, and into what's, whatsoever city or town ye enter, inquire in it, inquire in it is worthy, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And it continues on down through there, and I want to continue and pick up in verse 19. 
But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak. Now, as Chad mentioned this morning, we are instructed to be workmen. We have to study the Bible. So if someone says, why well, follow the Great Commission? I, I'm not going to worry about what I'm going to speak about. You're going to be unprepared in today's time. So again, the reason why I'm belaboring this point, there are a lot of characteristics of this Great Commission that are never discussed in many denominational churches. Again, I'm not attacking character. I'm saying the intentions may be good, reaching people for Christ, great intentions. But when you take this out of context, they don't even use the characteristics that are described in, in Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to pick up in verse 20. For it is not that ye that speak, but the spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Well, today we know if someone speaks, you better mark against the word of God to find out what they're saying. Because if I say I'm speaking from the Spirit, you can compare what I'm saying against the Word of God and say, is it really the Spirit that's delivering this message based upon the Word of God, or is this Jim giving you Jim logic? And as Chad said, the wisdom of man is not going to take you too far, especially the wisdom of me. It's not going to go very far. And again, to finish this up in verse 22, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Now, that definitely happens today especially if you're a grace believer, you can be hated for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Again, that is not a characteristic in the dispensation of grace. You can see how people can become confused. If you take someone who is truly sincere and they want to follow God's word, and they're in a church that talks about the Great Commission, and they take time to read Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 23, they're going to read this and they're going to get very confused possibly even about their own salvation. And so that's why I want to do a series of lessons on this to help eliminate confusion. This is one of the things that I found after leaving a denominational church, right division clears up. It clears up some of these confusions that you have. Am I saved or not? Well, the Bible says that I'm going to have to endure to the end. And, oh, I did not endure. So am I really saved? Was I really sincere? Did I really repent? All of these questions come into play. Let's go ahead and look at some of the individual characteristics. This is Roman numeral three in your outline. Some of the individual characteristics of the Matthew 10 Commission. I think I've listed, I don't know, about a half a dozen or so. And I like to go through several of these. Now, first of all, it's in effect until the Son of Man becomes. So in your outlines, if you noticed, this is not to scale, but I've kind of drawn the timeline at the top of your outline. You see Jesus' three-year ministry. And I think you have noticed in red, it says the kingdom at hand. And then there's a period of time after his ministry was over. Right now, it was about a year or so before Paul was given the mystery. That's the second column. And then we have the dispensation of grace. We don't know how long that's going to last. That's the question mark. And then after what we would call the catching up or the rapture, there may be a small period of time. That's the very small column. And then there is the great tribulation of seven years that occur. So that is the timeline, not drawn to scale, but that is the timeline. So this particular Matthew 10 commission is in effect till the Son of Man be come. So if you look down along the bottom, I have Matthew 10. They did not know at that time anything about the dispensation of grace. So as far as they were concerned, if you, all you have to do is read the book of Acts and Peter speaking, the end could come at any time. They were expecting it. The, the early church, the little flock, they sold everything they had because they were expecting the Lord to come back right away. So now turn to Matthew chapter 10, the context. How long was this great commission going to last? It was going to be in effect until the Son of Man become. Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, Matthew records, "Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man become. So from our perspective, we would say that this commission would be applicable until the second coming. Now, again, because we are in the dispensation of grace, it does not apply. So that's why I have the little dotted line that stops there. But according to Matthew chapter 10, 23, it says, You shall not go on over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So that's why we have that dotted line going all the way out there. So their commission was to go out and preach this message for that time frame. They did not even comprehend 
that uh, this was the other thing that was I found interesting. For, again, from our perspective, we would say that this commission would be applicable until the second coming. However, at that time, the 12 apostles did not even comprehend that he was going to die, even though it was revealed in the Old Testament. So this is where I want to throw out another parenthesis. The fact that Paul records the mystery, and all you have to do is read those verses about the mystery. This is how I was taught in denominational churches. The mystery was the fact that no one knew that Jesus was going to die and be buried and rose again. That's what I was taught, and the reason why I was taught that was because of these two verses I provided you. Look at Mark 9, and we're going to look at Luke 9. So the concept when I started coming here, when someone said, have you heard about the mystery? I say, well, yes, I've heard about the mystery. I know all about the mystery. But my definition of the mystery is different than what the Bible says the definition. The way I was taught was similar to what's recorded in Mark and Luke. So turn with me to Mark chapter 9, verse 31. Mark records... For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered unto the hands of man, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. 32. But they understood not that saying, and they were afraid to ask him. At that time, his apostles didn't, they didn't understand that. They did not know that. And then Luke, flip over to Luke chapter 9. It's recorded again, the same thing. And that's why I say to you, yeah, I heard of the mystery. What is this thing this church keeps on talking about, the mystery? Why is this so different? I already know what the mystery is. No one knew that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. Luke chapter 9, verse 43. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered every one at all things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not the saying, and it was hid from them, that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. And so, th for some reason, they just could not comprehend what he was going to do. And Jesus would constantly say that. He would say, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be falsely tried. I'm going to be crucified, but I'm going to rise again the third day. He telegraphed that countless times. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. This is what's going to happen. And they just didn't understand it. That was what I previously thought was the mystery. I was like, well, yeah, the mystery is that no one knew he was going to rise from the dead. But that problem was with me, as well as these apostles, they did not know their Old Testament well. So turn with me back to Isaiah. Because Isaiah prophesied this hundreds of years before. And if they were Old Testament scholars, they would have known this. And I, I, I believe the Pharisees knew this. But the Pharisees were not his disciples. But I'm looking at the 12 disciples here. Isaiah chapter 53. The fact that Jesus was going to come and die should have been common knowledge to everyone. It was not a mystery. It's just no one either read it or no one understood it. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 9. Now, we all know these verses now, but most people in denominational churches don't spend a lot of time in Isaiah, and I frankly didn't myself. So starting in verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. If we stop there, someone could say, well, it doesn't say anything about him dying. So let's read on. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We're getting warmer here. If someone reads this, they should think a little bit more closely. Verse 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened, up, opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. By now, it should be pretty hot to the fact that when you're going to take a lamb to the slaughter, somebody's going to die. 
And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. There it is. He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And if there were any doubt about the prophecy of his death, burial, and resurrection, you could just turn to Psalm. The 16th Psalm, verse 10, Psalm 16, 10 says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So all of a sudden, if you come from a background like myself and you say, well, yeah, I know the mystery. The apostles did not know he was going to die and rise again, and that was the mystery. No, it, it clearly was not a mystery. It was prophesied in the past. So all of a sudden, you can lay aside this concept. Well, the mystery was no one knew that Jesus was going to die and then rise again. No, that's not a mystery. That was prophecy. These prophecies are why Jesus could say in John 5.39, in John 5.39, he was speaking to the Jews at Jerusalem. He said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He said, you can search the scriptures, and you can find this stuff out. Now, us in the dispensation of grace, the mystery was not recorded in the Old Testament. The unsearchable riches of Christ, they're unsearchable. But Jesus as it was recorded in John chapter 5, he told him, go out and search the scriptures and you can find out what I'm here for. The concept of the mystery that needs to be remembered is, the mystery is not the fact that Jesus would come to the earth, die for sins, and then be resurrected, in this case, die for the sins of Israel, and then be resurrected as many denominational teachings would subscribe based on the reactions of the 12 recorded in Mark and Luke and the reactions of Jim as recorded through 45 years of his life. Or even the Gentiles could be saved. Some people will say, well, the mystery was the fact that Gentiles could be saved. Well, that has been recorded. Gentiles could have been saved. They had to go through Israel, but all you have to do is read about Rahab. All you got to do is read Ruth. That's an excellent story. I know I've taught on that before. That is a beautiful story. Gentiles could have been saved in the Old Testament, but they had to go through Israel. The Syrophoenician woman, she had to go through Israel. So the mystery is not the fact that Jesus came and died and rose again. The mystery is not the fact that Gentiles could be saved. All that could be happened. The mystery to which dispensational believers always espouse is that Gentiles no longer had to seek salvation through the Jews. Ephesians chapter 3. Turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 3. Because there was no hope for Gentiles in the Old Testament. There's no hope at all. We were without hope, unless you went through Israel. Here is what Ephesians chapter 3, here's what Paul writes in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. How that by revelation, again, Paul received this by revelation. The message he had, he did not get from Peter, James, and John. He did not get it from searching the scripture. It's clearly evident if you take the Bible for what it says, he got it by revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of man, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Okay, here's the setup. Here it is, verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So to whom, letter B, to whom do the participants minister? Now let's go back and talk about the Great Commission. So we know what it is. We know what the mystery is. So to whom do the participants minister? And I am running out of time fast. Matthew chapter 5, or actually Matthew chapter 10, and I'm going to have to race, and that's why I left these verses with you, because you're going to have to strap it on now, because I've got to move faster. Matthew chapter 10. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not 
into the way of the Gentiles and in any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go to the rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why would the Lord instruct the apostles to only go to the Jews with the message of the kingdom? Didn't he want the entire world saved? Everyone knows John 3.16. For God so loved the world, they gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I have a tie. I think I have a tie that says that. So if I ever missed it, I could always flip it around. So you always learn that. But if you read that verse, you don't, any, you don't hear anything about the death, burial, and resurrection. So John 3.16 can point you to the death, burial, and resurrection, but in itself it doesn't say that. Yes, it is true that he wanted the whole world to be saved even before Paul's message of the dispensation of the grace, but the Abrahamic covenant indicates that the nations would be blessed through Israel. And I know this is getting a little technical here, but yes, the Lord wanted the whole world to be saved but his prescribed method before the mystery was they had to go through Israel. And in this case, we talk about the Abrahamic covenant. And again, I'll mention Galatians 4, 4 through 5. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. So when Jesus came, he was made under the law. His ministry, when he walked the earth, it clearly says he was made under the law. The law was still in effect. And that is another verse that blew by me. I read Galatians tons of times over 45 years. But when someone said, well, you know, when Jesus was walking the earth, the law was still in effect. And they, they quoted Galatians 4 to me. And I finally read it with my eyes open. And I said, oh, yeah, he was made under the law. That is correct. And I, I want to be careful what I say here. But... I was always taught that you're baptized after you're saved because Jesus was baptized. But Jesus was also circumcised too. But you never hear that. You hear the baptism part, but you don't hear the circumcision. That's optional nowadays. And so, again, I was always taught something that was inconsistent. With good intentions. Again, I'm not impugning the character of the people. So what was the Abrahamic covenant? I just don't have time to go through that. If you'd like to do that on your own time, I've left verses in Genesis 12 and 28 for you to look at. I, I'm just running out of time. Okay, how are the participants to minister to the recipients? This is letter C on your outline. How are they to minister? And you should be able to see a contrast as opposed to today. Matthew 10.1, And we had called unto him the twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Well, that obviously didn't occur with Paul. Paul had his thorn in the flesh, and the Lord said, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. Uh, Matthew 10.8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. These actions are consistent with the power the Lord gave Moses. I won't have time to go there, but when Moses was being prepared... To for his ministry, he was to set up the kingdom by asking Moses to lead the Hebrews out of Egypt. And again, I don't have time to go there, but I, we talk about signs and wonders in Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. All you have to do is watch Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments, and you get to see a 1950s version of that, which I still think is pretty cool. I watch that every year. To me, I sit there, it's four hours long, but I'm up till midnight watching it. So if you want to see a visual of that, just watch that. They did a good job in the 50s. Charlton Heston was, was a good Moses, too. Um, so they did signs and wonders. Now, healings. Now, why were healings done during this Great Commission? And this, again, no one shared with me until I started coming to a Grace Church. I was always taught that believers... I guess the concept is called the priesthood of believers. I was always taught that teaching out of, I think it's the book of 1 John or 2 John. But there was a reason why there were healings in the Great Commission is because if you look at Leviticus, turn, there back, turn back there with me in Leviticus chapter 21. There was a purpose of the 12 doing the healings. It was not just because there were sick people. There was a purpose beyond healing because of sick people. The purpose was Israel was to be a priesthood of believers. And if you were to be a priest, you had to be, you had not to have any blemish. 
And so that's the reason why the healings occurred. Oh yes, you benefited from the healings, but the reason why, if you look at Leviticus chapter 21, starting in verse 16, and bear with me as I read through this, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. Verse 18, For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man, a lame man, or that he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous or a man that is broken-footed or broken-handed, or crooked back, or a dwarf, or that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or be scabbed, or hath the stones broken. Verse 21, No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest, shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish, he shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. So how can we be a priesthood of believers if we have a blemish? I should say, how can Israel be a priesthood of believers if they have a blemish? So that is part of the reason why there were healings and signs and wonders back in the time of Moses, and that's definitely why you saw healings during this great commission. 1 Peter 2, verses 5 and 9. This is what I was always taught, how we, and again, I'll use the phraseology, we as New Testament saints, that was the phraseology I always used, why we were a priest of believers. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. And this again is the problem when you start mixing the program of the kingdom with the program of the dispensation of grace. You mix these things together and you come up with confusion. Verse 5, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Well, we just read in Leviticus, you better not even come close to the altar if you have a blemish. But yet 1 Peter, New Testament, says we are a priesthood of believers, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy generation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. So you can see the confusion that someone like I had. I use that phrase all the time. We are a priesthood of believers. But that is not written to us. First Peter is not written to us. So that is why when the Lord Jesus Christ gave this Matthew 10 commission, to the twelve. He said, go out and heal the sick. They're going to be a priesthood of believers. I told Moses back in Leviticus that you better not come to the altar if you have any type of blemish. So if we're going to be a priesthood of believers, we got to fix these people. And today you see these false healings that go on all the time because the programs are messed up. I've got three more to talk about in about seven minutes. What should be the manner of the ministry of the participants? And we talked about this earlier, Matthew chapter 10, verses 9 through 14, so I'll go through this fast. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Now, when I was in denominational churches, there was a concept that was called deputation. And that is when missionaries that wanted to go out in the field would go from church to church and they would have to arrange their financing and it was called deputation. I never understood that term until some pastor told me, well, they're, they're raising money. I go, oh, okay. I thought deputation, I'm thinking of sheriffs, deputies, and I'm thinking, what's going on here? He said, no, they're raising money. Well, according to Matthew chapter 10, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. So in this commission, they were to go out and not have to do deputation. Because, it says, a workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town, I'm picking up in verse 11, that ye enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. So this great commission, these people would go out unprepared financially, present the great commission, tell everyone the kingdom is at hand. They need to stay with people. These people who were worthy, they would stay there, and that family would provide for them. 
a workman, in other words, their ministry, they were worthy of their hire. So if they did their great commission fine, they were to receive compensation by the people to whom they ministered. And again, picking up verse 13, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not be worthy, let your peace return to you. Verse 14, and whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of woods, wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Now again, that's a nice concept to have. We don't need to chew people up and spit them out. But this is part of the Matthew 10 commission. So now, look at letter E. What response should the participants of this great commission expect? What should they expect when they go out and give this great commission? Well, Matthew chapter 10, verse 17 starts explaining it. It says, Beware of men, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. Now, sometimes I would like to take advantage of that. This week has been a busy week. I would like to have not have prepared. And I can quote Matthew chapter 10. Well, I'm going to come up here and the Lord's going to put in my mind what I am to speak. But we are told to be workmen. Study to show thyself approved unto God. I need to be a workman. It's not going to come that easily. And when they persecute you, Matthew 10, 23, but when they persecute you, flee into another city. The speaking ministry of this commission is consistent with Moses' directive on Mount Sinai. Again, you don't need to turn there with me, but in Exodus chapter 4, and Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue, which is why he eventually had Aaron to do his bidding for him. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. There are lots of times I wish I could do that. The Lord is going to be with me, and I'm going to step up here, and I'm going to wing it, because Exodus, I'm going to claim the whole Bible, and Exodus says the Lord's going to be with me. And if you think today is a mess, just think how bad it would be if I would not have been even prepared as I am now. It'd be even worse. So you need to study. You need to be a workman. You can't claim the Matthew 10 Great Commission, and you can't claim these characteristics in your Bible study. It's just not going to work. Whether your intentions are good or not, you're not going to be able to heal the sick. You're not going to be able to pick up snakes. Uh, you're not going to be able to go out without having your financial house in order, whatever it is, whether you have a job and minister, which most of the grace preachers of which I know, they work full-time. Everyone here in this assembly who teaches has a full-time job. We ask zero compensation, and that's fine. We all do it willingly. It's our reasonable service. But you have to be prepared. And that's not the way it was in Matthew chapter 10. So let's finish with this. What was the characteristic of the message of this commission? What was the characteristic? Again, we talked about the kingdom of heaven as a hand, but the key word is repent. Now, this is a word that Paul uses too. And this is where you have to get some clarity because repent appears in Paul's writing and it definitely appears in this commission. But you have to understand the meaning of it. Because there, there can be two meanings to it. Let's look at the, let's first talk with Paul. When, when you talk about repent, it's a change of mind, a change of heart. It's, oh yeah, what I believed about salvation is wrong. What I should believe is that the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, died for my sins, he was buried, and he rose again. I have a change of mind. So when you read Paul, he talks about repentance, it's a change of mind. But in this great commission, repentance had a different connotation. This implies a turning back to the Abraham covenant. 
from which the children of Israel have strayed. So John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, he said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They had to have a turning back to the covenant. We don't turn back to the Abrahamic covenant. That's not the repentance to which Paul's referring. So, again, I'm sorry for going through this fast. We had a lot of ground to cover. Um, my hope is, when we continue on, I'm going to go through these other commissions. But to summarize everything in about a sentence or two is this. Many of the people that preach the Great Commission have great intentions. They, they themselves may be saved. They may want to see people saved. But they haven't rightly divided the word. So their intentions may be good, but they've misapplied the word of God and they become futile in their attempts because they're using these characteristics of the Great Commission in Matthew 10 to go out and preach what they want to preach. And that is not for us today. We don't preach the kingdom of heaven as at hand. We don't go out unprepared. We don't heal the sick. And I think that if you get a proper clarification, you can avoid 40 years of wandering in the wilderness like I have. Again, these men and, and, and teachers that taught me in the past the greatest of intentions, but if you can have that clarity, that's great. So again, I'm going to revisit this series I did a couple years ago. We'll probably pound through each one of these. More of a teaching session, but it should provide clarity for you, and my hope is that you can help others with that clarity. Father, thank you for your word. As I've said many times, the speakers here are fallible. Your word is not. So smooth over the mistakes that we say when we speak with your word. Let your word sink into the hearts of the men and women here. Let your word do the work. And I pray that the men and women can take these outlines, study it on their own time, go over it on their own, because it is of no private interpretation. They can read these verses, and your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, can teach them better than I could ever do it. And so I pray, Father, that your word does its work in the hearts and lives of everyone and brings clarity that is so uncommon in today's teaching. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.